Okay, first and second Peter, a message for today's church from Peter the Apostle, lesson number five in this series. Uh, title of this lesson, The Meaning of Grace, which is service. And if you're following along in your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. So this is our, our final lesson in our series on the various meanings of grace using the epistle of 1 Peter as our text. We will be moving on to 2 Peter in our next lesson. Okay, so so far we've said that Peter has understood very well the idea of grace, having witnessed the grace of God in both of its main concepts. One, the grace of God seen in the person of Jesus Christ. So Peter you know, has witnessed the grace of God because he was a witness of Jesus and his life. And so uh, this has worked itself out in his life because he's seen the gracious way that God has patiently selected the Jewish nation and has nourished and protected it throughout history in order to bring Jesus onto the world scene. Uh, he's seen the love that God has displayed in allowing Jesus to die for our sins and then of course raise Him from the dead to show that Jesus is God and that He had the authority to forgive sins and save man from eternal salvation. When we talk about this, we talk, it, we talk about it because we have learned it from the Bible. When Peter talks about this, he talks about it because he is an eyewitness of these things happening. Uh, Peter, as I said, was an eyewitness to all of these events that demonstrated God's grace in saving mankind. Again, for us, we read about it. For Peter, he saw it. And then the second way that Peter understands grace and writes about it here, uh, Peter also understands the idea of grace from a personal perspective as he himself experienced the changes that God's grace worked in himself and others who believed in Jesus. So his first epistle is a description and explanation of what grace means to the one who has been touched by it because of their salvation in Jesus Christ. So in the last couple of weeks, we have studied these, the things that happen to people when they are touched by the grace of God. For example, grace means a sense of security from the fear of condemnation for those who are saved. Uh, grace means a spiritually sober lifestyle because we're no longer addicted to sin and the world. Uh, grace means a, a willing submission to God's will in every area of life and the peace that comes with this type of submission. Grace means uh, living in harmony and love with others who have experienced God's love and salvation. And then grace means suffering at times because those who are saved from the world are no longer welcomed in it at times because of their affiliation with Jesus Christ. Okay, so today we're going to look at the final meaning that Peter ascribes to grace. Um, the last thing he says that grace does to our character when it touches us and that is grace means servanthood or grace means service. Now there's an old saying that goes, we have been saved to serve, right? We've been saved to serve. And the idea is that the purpose that God extends His grace in order to save you is so that you will become a channel through which His grace can reach others uh, to save them. And so our faith and our salvation finds meaning and satisfaction as we begin to find ways to serve God in the work of seeking and saving other people. So grace affects us how? Well, it affects us in the way that we begin to serve God and the fact that we do want to serve Him. So Peter uses the ultimate example of God's grace working in service in the church and that is working in the lives of the leadership of the church, the elders of the church. A person could not aspire to a more meaningful or gracious role in God's kingdom than to serve His church as an elder. So Peter specifically chooses this group to demonstrate how God's grace leads people into the service of the kingdom. So Peter, he doesn't describe the work of an elder in this particular epistle because he assumes everyone knows that elder, what an elder's role is uh, and that it is one of, of service. Uh, it's left to Paul, the apostle, 
uh, in 1 Timothy and Titus, not only to describe the elder's character, but the work that the elder does. Uh, teaching, offering hospitality, encouraging the church, defending against false doctrine. Peter the Apostle goes into these details, and so therefore Peter does not uh, in his particular epistle. Peter, on the other hand, reminds them that part of an elder's role also is to lead. And he uses this opportunity to teach his readers not only that grace produces leaders who serve, but uh, uh, leaders who serve in a particular way. Now there may have been some confusion as to the authority and role of the elders, and Peter explains that grace produces leaders who serve in the spirit of Christ, and he explains what that means in the following uh, chapter, in chapter five. So let's begin in chapter five, reading uh, verse one here. He says, therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. So Peter offers an exhortation. Exhortation is a word of encouragement or word of motivation to specific people among his readers and those would be the elders. Now, in the, uh, in the New Testament, there were three words that referred to the leaders in the church. Uh, all of these words pointed to the same person, but they described him in different ways. For example, you had the word uh, shepherd or pastor. This referred to the way that a man carried out his leadership role. You know, the imagery of the shepherd, you know, the imagery of caring and, and, and protection and nurturing, you know, th this was the image of the shepherd. Um, and this was used to describe the men who were to lead the church. How? By, by shepherding the church and, and to do this by caring and nurturing and, and, and through protection. And so we get the word pastor from this word and from this idea. Um, another word is uh, bishop or overseer, episkopos. Uh, this was a word that stressed the authority given by God to this man, to this uh, individual, if he qualified for this kind of service. Sometimes this word is used to describe the leader or the shepherd who is leading the church. Uh, the word referred to the fact that the overseers were responsible for the work within the church. And so this word um, demonstrated the, 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 the uh, authority that this individual had or these individuals had. And then another word, elder or presbyter. This particular word was used to describe the very same person as the others, but it was in reference to this person's maturity and experience. And so within the very same phrase, you could have all three words, but they all refer to the same person. For example, elders exercising oversight in pastoring their flock. There are the three words used to describe the same group of people, the same man or same group of people. Now what happened is with time, these terms were given to different people doing different jobs with different levels of authority. Um, and, and, and this is what we have today in various denominations, so on and so forth. You know, the term pastor, the pastor does, usually is the local minister, the bishop is kind of over several congregations or a particular area, and then you have archbishop and you know, things like that. Those, th those terms today refer to different people um, with different levels of authority and responsibility, but it was not like this at the very, uh, at the very beginning. Okay? In the New Testament church, all of these terms refer to the very same persons. Elders, shepherds, pastors, overseers, bishops, presbyters, all of these were leaders in the local church, and the terms all refer to the very same person. Now there's always more than one of these in each congregation when we read in the New Testament, and their authority was always limited to the local congregation. 
So you could have two, three, five, ten elders, but they were overseeing, they were managing, leading, if you wish, the work in one congregation. When you read through the New Testament, you never see an elder of one congregation go and be the elder of another congregation. You don't see the elder of one congregation being raised to the point where he is an elder over several congregations. Those were things that were added according to men's ideas uh, much, much uh, later. Okay? And so Peter recounts himself among this particular group because aside from being an apostle, right, one who had been called by Jesus himself and witnessed Jesus' baptism and his death and resurrection, he was that, he was an apostle, but he also served as an elder in the church at Jerusalem. So based on his role as inspired apostle and his experience as an elder, he teaches them how grace affects the service of those who lead in the local church. So one of the things he says about them um, is, uh, not just about them, but one of the things he says to them is shepherd willingly. And so we read in chapter five, beginning in verse two, it says, uh, or he says, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God. So what does he say? He tells them to shepherd, right? To feed the flock, take care of the flock, that's their job. He says the flock belongs to the shepherds and they are responsible for the direction and the feeding and the protection of that flock. So they have help in doing this, right? Deacons, preachers, teachers, saints, but it's still their flock and they're the ones who will answer to God for the souls won or lost, not these other ones. The deacons are not responsible for the souls. It's the elders that are responsible for the souls. Now, in connection with this, he also says that they are to shepherd willingly. And so do your job, right? Shepherd the flock. But shepherd willingly, not grudgingly. It should be a work that is eagerly done, not something that the elders have to be reminded of or pressured into. It should also be done according to God's will. And, and then he explains how, uh, you know, how that is. You know, he says, shepherd according to God's will. And then in the next verses, he explains what is the will of God as far as shepherding is concerned. And so first he says, well then shepherd for spiritual reasons. Verse uh, 2b, he says, shepherding the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and here it is, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. So how, how is shepherding according to the will of God? Well, shepherd for spiritual reasons to start with. You know, there are lots of reasons some would want to lead in the church, prestige, pride, Perhaps someone likes to exercise power, they like to get their way, and so it's good to be an elder. And perhaps for financial gain, especially those who preach and teach in leadership. Peter says that grace motivates men to become elders because they are eager to give something, not eager to gain something. He also tells them to shepherd by example, verse three, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. So how does the Spirit want leaders to lead? By example. In the world, a promotion means that your job is to organize and direct others to do the heavy lifting and to do the dirty work. In the church, Becoming an elder means that a man takes on the responsibility of acting like Christ, so that others will know how Christ would act in a given situation. Elders exercise authority through teaching, through encouragement and loving example, and, and are not to act like lords or kings. You know, they, they do it. Let, let a, the elders are saying, let us show you how to do this, not you must do this. Uh, how does the Spirit want elders to lead? Peter says they should shepherd with hope. Verse four, uh, he says, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crowd of glory. So the work is demanding, but the reward is great because the elders will receive from the supreme shepherd the highest of honors. You know, there's always a discussion about the degrees of rewards you know, in heaven. But the book of Revelation describes the throne of God surrounded with what? Surrounded with elders 
and then with saints, and then with angels. Grace creates a leadership that is different than the world. A leadership that is in harmony, that eagerly wants to serve its charge without complaining. A leadership submitted to God, a leadership that leads by example and not by decree, and a leadership with its eyes fixed on a heavenly crown, not a worldly crown. It means they lead with hope and joy, not with fear or doubt or, or negativeness. Now, you don't lead in a vacuum, do you? You need a, a proper response from the congregation in order to have a successful spiritual leadership. And so Peter explains that grace also affects not just the leaders, but it also affects the congregation and how they should respond to godly, gracious leadership. So he begins by saying, this is how the Spirit wants the leaders to lead. And then he says, and this is how the Spirit wants the church to respond to this type of leadership. So we read in verse five, he says, you younger men likewise be subject to your elders. And so the younger men are to obey their leaders. Some may have, you know, younger men may have ideas and agendas and talents, but grace, he says, allows the strongest of men to fold their ambitions and their talents into the direction of their elders in the church. And then he goes on to, uh, to say in verse 5b, he says, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So he now repeats this, not just to the young men, but to the entire congregation, and he adds that this humble attitude should not only be directed towards the elders, but should be the way that we treat everybody uh, in, in the church. So in the following verses, he's going to give three reasons why all of this is necessary. You know, that elders lead properly, that young men submit, that everyone in the church have a humble attitude toward each other. He's going to give three reasons why all of this needs to take place. First, he says, you need to be doing this because God loves those who humble themselves. Verse six, Therefore, he says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. God loves those who humble themselves. When leaders rely on God for strength to lead, when the church trusts God to guide them through their leaders, when everyone relies on God rather than self, God will provide everything that we need, not only to that church, back in the first century, but to this church today in the 21st century. And so grace enables us to humble ourselves before God, before our church leaders, and before one another. And that's a good thing, because God loves to see this happening. Secondly, he says, another reason why leaders ought to be doing what they do and the church ought to respond to them the way they should, is that the devil is looking for the proud. Verse eight, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So humility in leadership and in the congregation, that's not a curse. He's not saying this in order to punish people. He's saying this because it is the way to avoid the devil who eats proud people for lunch, so to speak. You know, the big favor that grace does for us is that it enables us to give up pride that leads to destruction and cultivate humility that keeps us safe from the evil one and out of his reach. That, that's the advantage that we have in humbling ourselves. Not only pleasing to God, why pleasing to God? Well, because you know, we save ourselves from being destroyed by Satan and God you know, doesn't want that to happen. All right, the third reason why leaders ought to lead the way they lead, we ought to respond the way we respond, is this. This particular attitude will be rewarded. Verses nine and 10, he says, but resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of grace who called you to His eternal glory in Christ will Himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So he says, this attitude will be rewarded. You know, that leaders lead the way they should, congregation answers the way it should. 
This is not a, an easy thing to maintain for leaders and followers. Some Christians in Peter's day were being martyred because of their faith and humbly accepted their death without giving up hope. The reason for this is that God Himself was perfecting and assuring and strengthening and establishing them in the kind of faith necessary to accomplish this. Accomplish what? Well, accomplishing the fact that they remained faithful even while they were being persecuted. So Peter says that God will do the very same for all those who allow the grace of God to create a humble heart in them. And so we get on to verse 11 here, and um, Peter has a doxology. Doxology is a, a kind of spontaneous praise. Let's read that in verse 11. He says, to him be dominion forever and ever, amen. So at the end of his teaching, he finishes with an expression of praise and reverence to God as he ponders the things that he has just said, knowing that God has given this to him in order to share with those he is writing to. Now the letters in those days, of course, as I've mentioned before, had the greeting at the end, and this letter is no exception. We read verse 12, he says, through Silvanus, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. So this letter was probably delivered by Silvanus, and in this verse he gives the summary or the theme of his entire epistle. This is what the grace of God is all about, he says. You know, it's about security and sobriety and submission and suffering and service. Remain firm in these ideas and remain firm in these practices. Verse 13, he says, She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. So the church in Rome um, is referred to as Babylon here, and his disciple and the one who served as his secretary, Mark, you know, Mark who wrote, John Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark, right? Well, he's the secretary. He's writing this for Peter. Uh, so Peter says, you know, I send you greetings and so does Mark. Send greetings. And then uh, verse 14 finishes it up. Says, greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ. So a final greeting and encouragement, you know, the holy kiss, even Peter talks about that. Of course, in those days, the men kissed the men, the women kissed the women. The men did not kiss the women you know, that, that were not their wives, okay? This is the idea of their greeting. Peace, of course, for those who are Christians. So uh, we've spent you know, several, several weeks uh, studying uh, this particular epistle to find out what exactly? What do we, what's the takeaway? Well, we, we wanted to find out two things. First, that the grace of God, that's what saves a person, the grace of God. Because of God's kindness, He offers us forgiveness through Jesus Christ based on our faith in Him. That is a kind act that He did. And everything that He did in order to, you know, to, to, to make sure that that took place. You know, the whole history of the Jewish nation, the life and death and burial of Christ, the church, so on and so forth, all of that it is a testimony to God's kindness and goodness toward us in offering us salvation in Christ through faith. And then the second thing, two things we find out, uh, that the grace of God changes a person. So the grace of God saves a person, the grace of God changes a person. Your time in this class has been well spent if you have learned how God's grace saves you, of course, and you take advantage of that by repenting and being baptized and accepting grace's offer of forgiveness. So you know, this class has been good for you if you're one of those individuals that has not responded to the gospel yet in faith uh, through the expression of uh, baptism, repentance and baptism. This is good for you because you know now, you know, what, what, what must I do to be saved? How do I access the grace of God? You know, you, you know that now. And then also your time has been well spent if you've also learned and begun to allow grace to change you into an individual who is secure in his salvation, an individual who is sober spiritually, an individual who is submissive to God, who can be strong in suffering, 
who can uh, provide a service uh, to the church. You know that you're allowing the grace of God to change you in these ways. And here's the connection between these two main ideas. The connection between these two is that if grace has not changed your life, then it hasn't saved your soul either. Okay. The salvation of your soul is witnessed by the change in your life. There has to be a change to witness the salvation, because that's what the salvation is all about. The salvation is there in order to change you. If there's no change, there's no salvation. Okay? So uh, I encourage you, if any one of these ideas is something that you need to understand more deeply, more perfectly, certainly you can all, always ask me uh, questions about that. And we're not out of uh, Peter's epistles yet. We're going to continue with his second epistle, uh, which I call Peter's last sermon. We're going to continue with that on, on our, uh, in, our next, uh, in our next lesson. Thank you very much for your attention and we are dismissed. <laughs>